Oberleutnant von Kossel initially remained at the regimental command post, while the rest of us were returned to our companies towards 6 a.m., where we received the warmest welcome. The news had spread like wildfire. First we ate, then at 8 a.m. the whole company fell in for the commander, who made his appearance virtually in rags and a thick dressing. He took his leave of me and was flown to the Charité Hospital in Berlin, from where it was hoped he might return in a week. Oberleutnant Rosshurt commanded the company until Kossel's actual return a fortnight later. The rest of us slept for a whole day, having so much sleep to catch up on. On the orders of the regiment, Unteroffizier Plotcher and I collaborated in writing a report, which seventy years ago set down the essentials. The events of the time burnt themselves into my memory. We were given fresh uniforms, and I went to Lieutenant Burkhardt's panzer as his gunner. The wagon was in good working order, and so did not require much attention. We rested. I received my birthday mail, which had arrived meanwhile. My parents sent me a packet containing a watch. My first, a little later, we moved out and had another look at the route we had taken on the morning when we occupied Starry Baicho. We went on standby again in a wonderful wood on the edge of town. We made ourselves at home and had everything we needed except water. We were to lay here until the attack over the Dnieper was resumed. The divisional motorcyclists were right forward at the river. Elements of Mulder's fighter squadron were at the airfield. Caravans, tents, field beds, radios. They had it all. If they needed beer or anything else, a Junkers transport aircraft brought it up. We had the greatest difficulty keeping ourselves and our clothing clean with the little water available. We were as filthy as pigs. We opened out our ground sheets near our panzer wrapped ourselves in a blanket and slept. We had no complaints, the time passed doing nothing, and we enjoyed our lives, which had hung by such a thin thread. In the evening I was informed of my promotion to Unteroffizier, with effect from 1 July for courage in the face of the enemy. It came so suddenly I could hardly believe it. The lieutenant organised a bottle of champagne, and we sat around a campfire near our panzer and drank together. The following morning my promotion to Unteroffizier was announced before the assembled company. In the afternoon I was accepted officially into the corps of non-commissioned officers, and in the evening had my first watch as orderly non-commissioned officer. It was absolutely quiet except for a Russian bomber, which made a low-level pass directly above us. I kept glancing at my shoulder straps to make sure that the lace was still there as I did my inspection that night. On 10 July 1941, the division began its attack across the Dnieper, not this time as a surprise blow, but after substantial preparation by artillery and the Luftwaffe. At 11am that day I had to report with my Dnieper comrades to the regimental commander. We were awarded the Iron Cross Second Class, Lieutenant Burkhardt and Unteroffizier Plotcher, the Iron Cross First Class. I was proud, and the day brought another surprise. At midday, the Abteilung ordered that Lieutenant Burkhardt and we four, who had come back with Oberleutnant von Kossel, were to proceed to Stari Baikau in order to cross the Dnieper with the first troops and look over our wrecked panzers. A group of the pioneer platoon with a rubber dinghy was assigned to us. We drove through Stari Baikau on two light tractors following our earlier route of advance and halted about 150 metres above the bridge position. There were Russians on the other side of the bridge, and we witnessed a low-level attack by two Mi-110s on their trenches, while the first men of our infantry regiment worked their way through the bridge wreckage to the far bank. Soon they had gained a foothold, and the first prisoners came over. Now we climbed across the bridge too, and reached the far bank. Left of the road, the first thing we found was the corpse of Lieutenant Koenig, recognisable only by his uniform, a ghastly sight which shook me to the core. We continued our search and found our dead comrades scattered near our panzers, on the road and in the river meadows, first my loader, the young Hofweber. He was terribly injured and must have suffered in agony until the coup de grace which the Russians undoubtedly gave him, then Krompert, Lindenberger and Stossel. These were still seated in their panzer, where a direct hit had torn off Lindenberger's head. Further on lay Girlsberger, and finally we also found Hans Ebersberg, who had pluckily covered the way back for his comrades, and while doing so received a fatal wound in the stomach. They had wanted to take him with them, 
but he requested that they leave him there and write to his parents when they had the chance. This was the worst thing of all in the whole campaign, to see comrades with whom one had sat in the panza, or to whom one was a friend, in such cruel circumstances mutilated and decomposing, almost beyond recognition. I went to my panzer and found some items which were still usable, but the Russians had taken most of it, and all articles of value. Meanwhile a man had come from the propaganda company, and he took snapshots of us in all possible positions. I had another look at the hole in which we had hidden, and marvelled that we had got out alive. Towards evening a company arrived which had been called up by a motorcycle dispatch rider. We dug graves for our comrades and buried them there in a simple soldierly way. Why did they have to die, and I survive? In the early hours of 11 July, we were ordered to make ready to cross the Dnieper and continue east. This gladdened our hearts. Towards midday we set out from the Stari Baichau airfield. On the way down to the river, we observed seven victorious aerial duels within an hour, which naturally went down well with us all. Around 3 p.m. we crossed the bridge which the pioneers had erected across the Dnieper. Previously we had made quite a few halts to prevent bottlenecks. Now the bridge was under Russian light artillery fire. The accuracy was poor, but nevertheless it was not very comfortable to be on the bridge watching the shells explode all around us in the water. We moved on quickly and crossed a second, longer bridge. The Russians had a view of the entire road and kept us under constant bombardment. Soon we got to a wood devastated by artillery and rockets. A large anti-tank obstacle blocked the road, and the countryside off the road was mined, but the pioneers had cleared a path for us, and our infantry now occupied the terrain. We drove down the big roll barn eastwards for about twenty kilometres, and then left it for a small village where we spent the night. The light platoon was deployed to secure our flanks, while we others first had to search the houses for Russian soldiers in hiding. Early next morning we set off again. Our panzer had engine trouble and was running too hot. If one opened the radiator cap all the water gushed out, and so we had to keep refilling it. The problem was the right side fan, which had stuck and could not be got going again. Towards midday we came under rifle and machine gun fire from a wood where we had intended to rest. Therefore we could not dismount, and so set fire to the wood. Around three hours our first company was ordered to advance. Nobody knew exactly what the problem was. We were ordered to battle readiness, and fifteen minutes later arrived in open country, where we received anti-tank gunfire which was falling too short. We could see the muzzle flashes and fired back but without visible effect. Unterofficio Visa, who left the panzer, was wounded in the foot by a shell splinter. Thereupon Oberleutnant Rosshurt sent two Panzer threes forward to clear the way for us. Feldwebel Dreher was hit and killed. The crew got out but Markgraf was lightly wounded. They all managed to reach the other panzer, if fairly exhausted. A further frontal attack would achieve nothing and so with elements of three company we detoured around this wood with its thick undergrowth and a field of wheat. Soon we caught sight of the Russian anti-tank guns and came under fire. We crossed a trench without loss, and rolling forwards at a fast pace, forced the Russian gunners to pull back, their two guns being rendered useless by a hand grenade in each barrel. Now we received more heavy anti-tank fire and could not identify from where it came. Two panzers were hit. Our losses were becoming too heavy, and the order came by radio. Cease fire, secure, turn back. We carried out the order, comical though the situation appeared to us. The panzers turned about, and the Russians fired into our rear. The company took the same way back. On the way we attempted to take in Tau Feldwebel Dreher's wrecked panzer, but this failed. We cleared it out completely, and took anything of use with us. At dusk we reached the wood in which the Abteilung lay. The other companies also had losses. Immediately upon arrival we tanked up and re-ammunitioned. Our panzer was running so hot that the carburetor caught fire, although it was quickly extinguished. In any case, we were not going to be able to move again until the mechanics got the fan working. Next morning it was planned to repeat the attack, but after this was cancelled the maintenance crew turned up. Towards 10am it was reported that the Russians were advancing on our wood. All available panzers were formed up and sent out to a meadow from where they fired all they had. The Russian artillery knew their targets, and so we too were obliged to seek refuge under our panzer now and again. 
The Russians attacked in waves, so that the situation occasionally looked very threatening. Our panzers began to run low on ammunition, and so we had to belt ammunition the whole time at the side of our non-operational panzer, if not lying in the muck when shells began to fall nearby. This went on all day. In the afternoon our panzer was repaired. Towards evening came the report that the commander of 2nd Company, Oberleutnant Rechfall, had fallen. His tank had run over a mine. He had had to abandon the vehicle, and so fell into the hands of the Russians. My panzer was now drawn into the defensive line, which pushed up closer to the Russian positions in the darkness. Overnight there were no events to report, except for some houses being set on fire. Oberfeld Webel Walowski of 3rd Company was wounded by a Russian who crept up to his panzer. At first light we pulled back a little, two 8.8 centimetres. Flak guns had arrived and were excellent and on target, now the Russians could come. They fired shrapnel and got a direct hit on the observation post, but there was nothing else to report. At midday we were relieved. The panzers were brought back to form up and then headed cross-country towards Propoesk. This time Second Abtelung was ahead of us. As on all previous advances, we had a grim struggle against the dust. The terrain was lightly undulating and not easy to monitor, with clumps of woodland here and there. Towards 4pm, a long halt was called, and the order given for battle readiness. The panzers were well camouflaged in a corpse. We refuelled and took on more shells. I got the gun ready myself, cleaning and draining the barrel. The field kitchen brought up hot food for a change. We all sat around the panzer. The spies was there too, and we chatted about this and that. We were still feeling the effects of the very heavy fighting of the last few days, and so our talk was not particularly optimistic. But moods changed often, and the next day we would probably be thinking the opposite. We had been held up by a damaged bridge over a stream. This had been repaired by the pioneers, and our Abtelung now led the way forward, first company in third place. Second, Abtelung was well ahead of us all and had pushed up near the town of Propoesk, but the attack had been held back until next morning on account of the late hour, although we ourselves kept rolling. Soviet fighters circled above us without attacking. A halt was called once it was fully dark. We went into thick woodland. Great discretion was called for. The Russians were lurking everywhere along the roll barn. They could work their way up to a panzer and lob in a Molotov cocktail. It was something tried against us by the Russians for the first time here, but fortunately for us, not on this occasion. 15 July 1941. A few men stretched out on the rear of the panzer, slept for 15 minutes. We could hear firing ahead. Second Abteilung was on the move again. We set off at 1.30am. Scarcely had we exited the wood than we saw on our right a burning German armoured scout car. The Russians had brought up a 105mm gun somewhere nearby, and were shooting directly at us. A house in the vicinity was burning, illuminating everything with a ghostly light. All around was deepest night. We increased the distance between the panzers and drove flat out across the danger area. All hatches were tightly shut. The driver floored the gas pedal. The explosions sounded strange so close to the panzer. Through the sight I saw a brief flash at each impact and shell splinters would fly against the panzer armour. We were happy to get through it, it was simply impossible to make out where the gun was. Soon after we came to a village still occupied by the enemy. We received fire from every house, but nothing to worry us. Rifle bullets whistled around our turret. I had to admire the motorcycle infantry of our reconnaissance platoon. They had no protection at all, but just drew their heads in and kept as close as possible to the side of the panzer. They got through all right here, but later suffered dreadful losses. From ahead we were told that 2nd Abteilung had entered Propoisk and held the three important bridges behind the town intact. These bridges, about 400 metres long, crossed a small river in a valley and were of all wooden construction. The valley was overlooked by the enemy, but the panzer division went through the middle of them and left them left and right for the following troops to mop up. Dawn had begun to be visible in the east when we drove into the town. First, we stopped on one of the main roads and severed the telephone wires with wire cutters. Then the company was divided up across the whole town in order to secure its most important points. Here and there the first fires broke out. The Russians set fire to everything in their retreat. 
Our panzer stood with another for two hours on security. The crew of the other panzer rooted out twenty Russians from a house. They threw down their weapons and surrendered. Towards 8 a.m. we formed up in the town again. Unterofizia Mendeletz's panzer, just come out of the workshop, ran over a mine while passing a demolished bridge. Nobody was hurt, but the driving wheel at the rear was done for. Lieutenant Burkhardt took our panzer to tow him in. Meanwhile, I went with my loader into town to look over the shops, but found nothing much worth having. We spent a while rummaging in a Russian mixed goods store, which sold everything from furniture to underwear and toys, naturally all cheap Soviet stuff. When our panzer came back, Burkhardt hadn't been able to tow Mendeletz, and so we loaded aboard a 20-litre barrel of some cheap alcoholic drink and set off to join the company. It was no easy task to find it, and we cruised the streets for a good half hour. The population would have been around 15,000. Because the buildings were all wooden, it had started to burn everywhere. After half an hour, we ran the company to the ground at a fuel dump on the edge of town. Two men, armed with a pistol and hand grenade, got out from each panzer to search the place. It was found that the barrels and tanks were empty. The company now received orders to secure the town against attack. The situation was approximately as follows. Our panzer was the most advanced, with a potato field ahead of us. The Russians had dug an anti-tank ditch 200 metres in front of us. The panzer itself stood in an abandoned gun emplacement, and so therefore we had a good field of fire. There were shell casings and cordite bags lying everywhere. We stretched out in the sun and tried to catch up on lost sleep. Suddenly, Lieutenant Burkhardt saw a head appear behind a row of potatoes. He pointed it out to me without making a fuss. I went at once to my gunner's seat and traversed the gun slowly. The Russian made no move. I fired and high explosive shells which could not have missed. The whole affair seemed peculiar, and so the light platoon was sent to investigate. It turned out that between our panzer and the anti-tank ditch in the potato field in front of us was one infantry slit trench after another. One could not do very much from the panzer, and so the light platoon got out and we fired at everything that moved. With hand grenades and pistols, they cleared all the slit trenches one after the other, so that by midday it seemed that the job was finished, except for the occasional find here and there. Wrong again. Suddenly there appeared close to our panzer from a large, previously undiscovered trench, fifteen men and a commissar. When we opened fire on them, they put their hands up. The crew wanted to disarm them, at which the commissar threw some egg-shaped hand grenades at us, and they all disappeared into their bunker again. A hand grenade of our own which we tossed in was returned at once. The next hand grenade killed the commissar, and the rest of them surrendered. Relative calm returned until the evening. Another unit, motorcycle infantry, I believe, took over the security. Previously, we had set a nearby village alight with gunfire in order to illuminate the surrounding terrain. While doing this, a shell burst in the barrel of the commander's panzer, rendering it useless. Because our panzer was in the best condition, Lieutenant Burkhardt was replaced by Oberleutnant Rosshurt as commander. The former commander's panzer went to the weapons workshop. In the previous weeks of fighting, the company had had several breakdowns due to engine failure and was down to its last five Panzer threes. Russian oil and petrol and the long-distance runs had taken their toll. We drove through the burnt-out remains of Propuesk and together with other e Abteilung companies, secured ourselves against Russian attacks in a tall cornfield. One man per panzer had to stay awake, and so towards midnight I could finally turn in. Packed into a sleeping bag with a blanket on top, I had a wonderful sleep in the corn until 2am when we were awoken again. All of I Abteilung formed up in order to follow two Abteilung, which had meanwhile reached Kritschev and secured a bridgehead there. That morning it rained torrentially, so that we had to shut all the hatches tight and try to sleep during the drive. After 25 kilometres, an order came, probably by radio, and the entire Abteilung suddenly had to turn around, drive back through Propuesk and Park in a wood. By now the weather had improved somewhat. There was much to do aboard the Panzer, always the same, clean weapons, etc., all of which took up a lot of time. The right-hand fan had stuck fast again, so that the same work had to be undertaken as a few days previously. Once this was finished, one could have a quick wash and shave, or lay out on a blanket and sleep. To have a meal in peace once in a while was a boon. 
The wood had wonderful strawberries and were eaten with sugar, which we never lacked. They tasted quite excellent, and moreover contained the vitamins so sadly missing from our diet. So, towards 3 p.m. the following day, the order came to make ready, and a little later the Abteilung moved out and crossed the three great bridges beyond Propoisk. First, we drove 35 kilometres on the Rollbahn, went through Chernikov, and then left the road to the right and came to a halt in woods 23 kilometres from Kritschev. Here, we were told we would have several days' rest. We put up a tent near our panzer and had a glorious sleep. Our people brought a pig, and over a small fire I spent three hours making wonderful roast pork. It tasted just like home cooking. The only thing missing was the potatoes, so we had to make do with bread. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Burkhart had driven to the workshop to check on the panzers there. We simply had to increase the numbers, and so he went there to see for himself and bring back as many as possible to the company. On the roll barn troops of our division rolled by unceasingly. There was a lot of heavy artillery in particular, which we thought would be for the bombardment of Moscow. In the afternoon I bathed in nearby water, the first time I had had a proper wash in the entire campaign. We were black as soot from dust, filth, oil and powder smoke. Our bodies were grey, the pores black, dust clung to hair and beards. All the next day there was nothing to report. The barber came to shear us. The tailor and cobbler also paid us a visit. Both were overwhelmed with work. That day those of us who had been involved in three attacks were awarded the panzer assault badge, although we did not receive it until much later, because division had run out of them. In the evening at Three Company a concert with the regimental band for the birthday of the Abteilung commander was scheduled, but towards evening came the order for battle readiness. No information was forthcoming as to why. We had been promised several days rest here. Later we discovered that the Russians had recaptured the roll barn in our rear and surrounded the panzer pioneers who had camped on it. We moved out at 7pm, Three Company in the lead. The spearhead vehicle was that of Lieutenant Hohnstatter, who had been in charge of our course in the Vortelage. Beyond Chernikov, we crossed a bridge which was under observation by the Russians, so that every time a panzer arrived on it a shell would explode nearby. The bridge was hit several times, but was quickly repaired. Towards ten that evening the spearhead vehicle got through to the panzer pioneers without opposition, and relieved them. They had protected themselves by laying mines on the road and these were soon removed. The advance was resumed. On the road it was pitch dark. In these memoirs I have reported in my own words on the opening days of the campaign in the East, as I experienced it as a gunner in a Panzer III. I have described the Starry Baichau operation particularly extensively, since it opened all the doors to my future career. As we came to realise in the fighting around the Propoisk bridges, the struggle was now becoming fiercer. Our panzer spearheads forced their way forward along the rollbarns without concerning themselves about the enemy they left behind to their left and right. On 3 August 1941, Roslavl was taken. Other units were ahead of us and we detoured around the town in order to remain on the heels of the enemy as his principal pursuer. I was in the spearhead panzer and we stepped up the pace so as to maintain contact with the retreating Russians. It was hot in the interior and we drove with the side hatches open. A wooden bridge on the outskirts of Roslavl failed to take the weight of our fast-moving panzer, collapsed and we plunged off it. It was only a minor mishap, but three fingers of my left hand were crushed by a falling beam. I was given an emergency dressing and taken to the main dressing station before being conveyed over 100 kilometres to the nearest railway station in a swaying field ambulance with seriously wounded men. The station installations were being repaired, while the tracks were being changed from the Russian broad gauge to European gauge. Even if they managed 30 to 50 kilometres a day, the line remained quite a distance from the nearest front. Ammunition and fuel were the principal commodities being brought out from the Reich, and the trains returned there with the wounded. After seven days on a train initially in a goods wagon on straw, then, from the Polish border in a hospital train, on 11 August 1941, I arrived at a military hospital in the heart of Germany, at Greitz, in Thuringia. A fine doctor saved me from having to have three fingers amputated. They were pierced at the tip and stretched for six weeks, in extension bandaging. 
On 12 August, my mother came from Oberbarenburg, followed a few days later by my father, who was taking a cure at Bad Oberschlemer. By the beginning of October 1941, the wounds were well healed, the fingers just a little stiff, and I was discharged to the Panzer Reserve Abteilung at Bamberg. I received 14 days convalescent leave, my first leave as a soldier. It was wonderful to be at home again, and with pride I showed myself in town in the black panzer uniform with the iron cross. My father took me to his reserved table with his boon companions. It did me good to know that he was proud of me. Back at the reserve Abteilung in Bamberg, I was given a corporal shaft, 16 recruits to train. Since I had only spent a few days in a barracks with its very rigid daily programme, this duty was totally strange to me. I was much more a Frontschwein than a strict disciplinarian, translator's note. In both world wars, a Frontschwein was a soldier who had served at the front and been awarded the Iron Cross Second Class and the Wound Badge. Therefore, I had some difficulties. At New Year, I had another six days free of duty and went home. On 25 February 1942, I reported as officer applicant for the course being held in Berlin at the Panzer Troop School, Wunsdorf. The tutor attached to my class was Hauptmann Volschlager, of Panzer Regiment 35, a close friend of my former commander von Kossel, who knew of the events at Stari Baichau. Therefore, Volschlager was well disposed towards me. I enjoyed the course, although it was three months slog, day and often night, under observation by countless instructors, senior non-commissioned officers and officers, who judged whether one was up to the mark. I led the only infantry night exercise of the whole group of candidates, four classes, which brought me much praise. As a panzer man, I had little knowledge of the infantry, but spending the Easter holidays with my cousin Bernhard Schoner, a Hauptmann in the infantry, at his home in Berlin. He knew by heart not only the opening situations and the course of the exercise, but also all orders I had to give as its commander. My personal contribution was that at the beginning of the exercise, I had to hammer home as intensively as I could to the assembled group. The particular significance of red, green and white flares to begin, end or suspend the exercise, and repeat myself over and over again. My course colleagues considered that I had treated them as being stupid, and in the beer newspaper at the end of the course composed a poem, You Prussians always lay down the law, thoroughness will win the war, or words to that effect. I believe that in all my commands, even in the post-war Bundeswehr, I was similarly thorough, even pedantic, and never asked too much of my subordinates. At the end of the course, on 1 June 1942, all the candidates paraded on the exercise ground at 9am. We were all promoted to Fahnen Junker Feldwebel, Officer Cadet Senior Grade, Sergeant Rank. Then the best of the course were announced. I was completely surprised to be called forward first and received the prize for best in my class. After the ceremony, we sat in our rooms, sewing the sergeant's star on our uniforms. At 11am we had to parade again, and now in a rather solemn ceremony, 70% of us were promoted to lieutenant. As the best in platoon, my effective date was not 1 June 1942, but 1 February 1942, so that I had several months seniority over my colleagues. The junior lieutenant's uniform hung in the locker. Four weeks previously we had received our uniform purchase warrant and could now have our uniforms tailored. All active officers provided their own uniforms, receiving a one-off clothing payment and a monthly clothing allowance. Now we had to order jacket, long trousers, riding breeches, boots, greatcoat, cap, dagger, and, if one wanted, a sabre. This kept us and the tailors very busy in the next few weeks. The following morning at 7am buses arrived to transport us to the Sportpalast to hear an address by Hitler. The place was packed with all men from the army, Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine, promoted to the equivalent rank of junior lieutenant with effect from 1 June 1942. We had to wait four long hours until the event began at midday. I was not impressed either by the entry of the Führer, the introduction by Goering, nor Hitler's speech. The jubilation ordered was more mechanical than emotional. Although this was the first time, I had seen Hitler in the flesh I was not stirred. I was simply happy to have achieved my first career goal, for there had been some stumbling blocks even at Wunsdorf. In the evening, colleagues and I celebrated our promotions in the Hungaria bar, 
near the Gedachtniskirche, until my train to Rastatt left at midnight, eight days operational leave. Subsequently, I had to report back to the Panzer Reserve Abteilung at Bamberg, where I hoped that Panzer Regiment 35 would soon request me. There was no rush, however, for the Abteilung liked to hold on to its young officers for several months in order to have youthful instructors. First of all, I had to provide basic training to the recruits of 3rd Company. This was pure infantry business. I say again, I liked nothing in the whole infantry bag of tricks. I could attempt to provide training which was more human and intelligent than what the barrack wallahs served up. I found the unnecessary grinding down, which I had myself experienced, repugnant. In Bamberg at that time, a company had been formed as part of a new panzer battalion, which was to be equipped with the newest German development, the Tiger. They were still at the prototype stage, but wonderful things were predicted of them. Weighing 58 tons, an 8.8 centimetres gun, thick armour, almost a life assurance. The commander of this forming company was Hauptmann Lang, who was at liberty to choose his future personnel from the reserve Abteilung. He asked me in the mess one day if I was interested. I was fixated on my old regiment, however, and wanted to go back to von Kossel, and so firmly declined his very interesting offer. But Lang had a hotline to the Army Personnel Bureau in Berlin, and a few days later my transfer came, though, to 2nd Company Heavy Panzer Abteilung 502. At the same time, the formation of this company was moved from the barracks at Bamberg to the falling Bostel troop depot on Lundberg Heath. I arrived there at the end of June. Advanced detachments were also coming from other panzer garrisons, so that in a short time, Heavy Panzer Abteilung 502 was up to full strength in personnel in all its companies. Our second company had seven officers and some Panzer III's for its light platoon, but still no Tigers. As the youngest, I had to take over infantry training, for soldiers had always to be kept busy with something while we had no Panzers. It was my task to provide four hours of purely theoretical instruction in shooting every week. It was not so developed then as it is today, and after a while I ran out of things to say, but somehow I stayed on the course without looking a fool. My talks were certainly not dynamic, and I confirmed to myself that I was better at the practical side than the theoretical. From 21 July to 20 August 1942, I was in the military hospital at bergen fallingbostel with Volvulus and had to undergo a similar operation as the one two years before at Rastatt. I had convalescent leave until 30 September and spent it very pleasantly at home. Meanwhile, the first company had received their Tigers, and the entire Abteilung Bar 2nd Company was transferred to the Leningrad Front. There, the first operational deployment of the Tigers took place under very unfavourable circumstances. A crazy order was given for them to attack over a log road in heavy swamplands. Equally crazy was the intention of the Abteilung commander, Major Marker, to transfer 2nd Company to the Abteilung on the Leningrad Front, even though it had no Tigers and thereby complete the formation of Panzer Abteilung 502. The necessary order arrived at 2nd Company, and caused Hauptmann Lang, inferior in rank to Major Marker, no end of displeasure. The Abteilung had no fixed accommodation, being in the midst of woodlands, and so the company would have to excavate its own earth bunkers. Hauptmann Lang sent me as a courier to the Abteilung on the Leningrad front, in order to inform the commander orally that Langer was not disposed to carry out the order to transfer second company, and also put it in writing. I took the most careful note of Langer's language, so as to convey the message with the same urgency and brevity to Marker. I took the front leave train via Berlin for the three-day run to Krasnovardaisk, the last station on the German railway line near the outskirts of Leningrad. Major Marker let me make my report, but when he heard that second company was not going to be transferred, he interrupted me in a fury. He repeated his order and threw me out of his bunker, not without having ordered me first to return forthwith to Farlingbostel in order to relay this order to Lang. Thus, I was at the Leningrad front for two hours and now returning to the Reich, this time a five-hour run in a convoy of lorries passing through dangerous partisan country, then a flight, my first ever, in a Junkers Ju 52 aircraft from Pleskau to Riga. I had six hours there free to do some sightseeing, 
then caught the front leave train to Berlin. Hauptmann Langer laughed when I described Marker's reaction. He went to the telephone and spoke to the Army High Command in Berlin. As a result, Second Company was not transferred. We stayed at Fallingbostel. In December 1942, rumours were rife that Second Company would eventually be incorporated into the Waffen SS, because the Panzer Regiment, SS Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler, was to receive an additional Tiger Company. Since the reservoir of experienced Panzer men in the Schutzstaffel at this stage of the war was not so large that an operational unit could be formed quickly. Somebody remembered our second company, which was at that time separated from its Abteilung at Fallingbostel. What could be better than simply to transfer this company of experienced Panzer men into the Schutzstaffel? Then the issue of Tiger Panzers would follow much more quickly, because Schutzstaffel units got preference in all matters of supply and equipment. The rumour was therefore based on a certain logic, and there had been similar cases. Those who would have been affected were not consulted, but thank heaven it did not come to that. Meanwhile, the situation on the Eastern Front had come to a head. Two Soviet army groups had met up at Kalach after a wide pincer movement and encircled the Sixth Army at Stalingrad. Stalingrad was one of the greatest disasters in German military history, but it was not the only defeat of strategic dimensions. In November 1942, US troops had landed in strength in Morocco and Algeria. At the same time, Rommel had been forced to retreat westwards with his army after El Alamein. These three events, together with the collapse of the U-boat war in the spring of 1943, were the military turning points of the Second World War. The war could no longer be won. We were now to head to the Stalingrad front to take part in the relief offensive as an independent company. While our heavy panzer Abteilung 502 was tied down on the Leningrad front in the north, we were attached to Army Group Don. As an independent company, we needed additional signals, supply and workshop units, which otherwise only existed in the Abteilung organisation. What happened next was a masterpiece of organisation by Army High Command. Within two days, we received from all parts of the Reich a supply, transport, workshop and tank recovery platoon. The equipment came from one direction, the personnel from another. Within days, the company grew from around 150 men to 500. At the same time, the new Tigers came from the Henschel Works at Kassel, a total of nine between 21 and 26 December. One Tiger for the company commander, two platoons each with four Tigers and a light platoon with eight Panzer threes, made up the fighting component of the company. Each platoon had two officers. I was half-platoon leader in Oberleutnant Scherf's first platoon. This generous allocation to the Tiger Company would not last long, however, for coming events reduced the number of officers, and we received no replacements. When one reads all this, perhaps it is possible to imagine what feverish activity consumed us in those days. The first railway transport left Farlingbostel Station on 17 December 1942. On 24 December, I was sent with a lorry and two men to a Saarbrücken foundry to fetch ice shoes for our panzer tracks. Christmas evening I spent in a tavern at Echternach, where they prepared for us a hare which we had run over in the street. I telephoned home and so had contact with my parents. People today will hardly understand how difficult this was then. One could not dial a trunk call. At that time in most towns, one could dial a number direct but a trunk call had to be connected up from one exchange and often through various others. This could easily take hours, a call could be booked as urgent, but then it cost double. The Blitz's call was ten times dearer. In the latter case, one could be connected within ten minutes. Probably my call unsettled my parents more than it pleased them, for they might have thought that I was calling from the front, from the place most mentioned in the army bulletins, Stalingrad. On the drive back along the Cologne-Hanover autobahn, I relieved the exhausted driver during the night. There was thick fog, the headlamps were blacked out, so I saw virtually nothing. Driving was such hard work that I fell asleep for a few seconds. The lorry left the road and mounted the verge, the radiator colliding with a large signpost. The radiator withstood the impact, but a mudguard was crushed inwards, and the windscreen cracked. Now the cold kept us awake. On 26 December I got back to Fallingbostel in the early morning and got a rocket from the commander for the damage to the lorry, but before we began loading up, 
The workshop had repaired it. My transport left Follingbostel at five in the morning of 28 December 1942. In the cattle truck this time was a round iron stove and fuel for it. It was beautifully warm sitting right in front of it. Thank heavens there was a stop now and again, when the steam locomotives there were only stretches of electrified track in Bavaria, and Saxony had to stop for water and coal. Then one stretched one's legs and food would be served from the field kitchen lorries. Some people played marathon scat. I once played for 24 hours non-stop and lost a fortune. Others dozed off or slept. This kind of railway journey was certainly neither full of new things to see nor comfortable. If the train halted along an open stretch of track for signals, this would be used as a toilet stop, since there were no facilities on board, and this all in deepest winter. When the signals changed, the locomotive whistle blew, and then generally the driver would allow enough time for trousers up and scrambling back aboard. While on this subject, I would mention that if there was a long run without a stop, naturally this could be very unsettling, and the business had to be conducted at the open door of the wagon. If the running board was icy, or the night was dark, or a tunnel came up suddenly, it was a dangerous operation, but we quickly became used to it. Although we were categorised as blitz transport and had priority over all other traffic heading east, the journey went on for days. On New Year's Eve, the train reached Gumel in White Russia. Here we had to change the panzer tracks. Our normal tracks were too broad for rail transport on central European stretches, and so there were special wagons for tigers which had the narrower tiger tracks. The changeover was done at Gomel in the bitter cold, and with the iced over ramp it was difficult work for the crews. We did not see the New Year in, and so it was a New Year's Eve I shall never forget. Three days later we arrived at Rostov-on-Don. The railway buildings and platforms were crammed with nervy Romanian soldiers, a stoic mass, few carrying weapons. They looked like an army on the run. German railway men advised that the Russians had broken through the Romanian lines again, and now there was no end to their panic. The railway people said we should sit in our panzers for the rest of the journey. The Russians could break through anywhere and suddenly appear on the railway line, so we did what they said. The panzers were manned so that we could defend ourselves should it become necessary. It was bitterly cold in the panzer. It did not seem to us that we were setting out on a bright and joyful war despite the super panzers we had brought along. On 6 January 1943, the train reached our destination at Proletarskaya, on the edge of the Kalmuk steppe. Previously, we had passed through Manich, the geographical border between Europe and Asia. That evening the entire company was assembled to be told that we were now attached to 17 Panzer Division. Next morning we set off on a ten and a half hour drive to the Kuberle sector, our future operational area. We formed part of Panzer Regiment 39 and would work together with Panzer Company Sander of the regiment. It was stepper warfare with no fixed front on either side. Our objective was to seek out and destroy the enemy. The operation began on 8 January 1943. It is not my intention to describe it, even though I remember it well, but what happened straight away was something I had never experienced before. Towards evening on the first day, we had to beat off an attack by Russian infantry supported by tanks. We were on fairly elevated ground and could see over the terrain before us for miles. In the distance I saw the black dots of an immense army of ants making its way towards us, between them were larger black points, tanks. Two Russian infantry regiments, about 4,000 men with armoured support, were attacking us. We let them approach, destroyed the tanks, and then went for the infantry, which began to dig in hastily. They were brave, one has to give them that, we couldn't force them to retreat, and as darkness fell, we pulled back because they would not leave their positions. In the action report it stated that we wiped out about a thousand Russians. We lost a Panzer III, which, without our being able to prevent it, as if intentionally, had headed ever deeper into the Russian lines and suddenly disappeared into the haze. We never heard from the five-man crew again. Furthermore, we had three wounded and had to tend to Lieutenant Forkel, who had a broken arm. We spent the night in the open, but never again. The temperature fell to minus 30 degrees centigrade, in future, the last operation of the day would be to occupy a village to spend the night in. If the Russians got there first, we attacked and ejected them, 
In that respect, the Russians were no different from us. There were not too many villages in the steppe, and so one had to make sure they were preserved and not destroyed. The owners would sleep on or around the stove, we on the floor or under the table. They were friendly people, the Kalmuks. Naturally, they were suffering because of the war. Next day, Lieutenant Tauber fell. He was outside the panzer and was hit by small arms fire. We had many problems with our tigers. They were new and had hardly been properly tested. We also had the impression that a lot of the problems could be attributed to sabotage at the production stage. Therefore, we were fighting on two fronts, against the enemy and against technical difficulties. Our workshop had its work cut out to mend the damage. Corps ordered that the battle-worthy panzers of the company, three Tigers and seven Panzer threes, were to be placed under the command of Oberleutnant Scherf of 16 Infantry Division Motorized. We were then involved in several actions with long stretches of countryside in between. On 14 January, the three Tigers were ordered to proceed west to Komarov to relieve 16 Infantry Division Motorized and then return to the company at Proletarskaya. The Panzer threes remained under the orders of division. The relief of 16 Infantry Division was more difficult than at first thought, because a ridge with a strong Russian anti-tank position blocked the way. The three Tigers exchanged fire with the anti-tank guns, but there were more guns than we had previously identified. We received hits. Suddenly over the radio a shout from Scherf to me, Have shell damage, you take over. I was perplexed. I had never been in such a situation before, now it was up to me to take out the enemy guns. I reacted at once and radioed, understood out. And without further reflection, Rosen to 224. Anti-tank gun on the ridge ahead. Go, naturally we never used names over the radio, but I cannot remember the cover names we used. And what a surprise for me. Panzer 224 set off at once. My own driver followed as fast as the terrain allowed, and we reached the position on the ridge. To my great relief, we did not come under fire. The Russians had run for it, leaving behind all their guns and some American jeeps, which were now becoming an increasingly common sight here in the east. The attack had been a success, my first as commander. For me, all my doubts were dispersed, and now gradually I became an experienced platoon leader while a relationship of trust developed between my panzer men and myself. We could rely on each other. It lasted until the end of the war. Nothing now prevented the relief of 16 Infantry Division. We had carried out our mission, and the three Tigers were to make their way back to the company at Proletarskaya. I don't remember what the distance was, maybe 30 kilometres. It was reported that Tiger 224 had engine damage. It could not be started up, and would have to be towed, a difficult job over so long a distance. Scherf told me that he would go on ahead to company with his tiger to inform the retrieval platoon and send them out towards me. With our radio equipment, it was not possible to contact the company over such a distance. I was given the order to tow 224 as far as I could. In an emergency, I would have to blow it up. We needed to get a move on. After the division's troops had pulled out, we were now alone in wide open country, and our route passed for the main part through no man's land. Scherf bustled. We attached the towing hawser, and my platoon set off at a very reduced speed, as one can imagine. We could not make out the road. Everything lay under a blanket of snow, and the tracks in the snow could equally well have been made by Russian as German troops. While daylight remained, I could see Scherf's tiger tracks in front of us quite well, but soon darkness fell and standing in the open turret hatch, it was damned cold. Careful if one's ungloved hand touched the armour, it stuck. From his seat, the driver could see even less than I from the commander's position in the turret, and so I had to talk him through it. Herr Lieutenant, the engine is boiling, I have to stop, he called up to me after a while. Damn, right in the middle of the step, there was damage to the fan, and our limited tools aboard did not extend to this kind of repair. The cooling water thermometer read over 100 degrees, while 80 degrees was normal. We had to wait for the temperature to drop. After a quarter of an hour, the driver reported that we could proceed. Now we had to go slower than before so as not to overtax the engine. Then again, the engine was too hot. How were we going to cross the step like this? The moon rose. It became a little brighter and easier to see the tracks in the snow. 
The engine noise could probably be heard for miles in the stillness of the night. All the worse for the rhythm of turning off, waiting to cool, starting up again. These noises proclaimed that here was a lame duck, ripe for the taking. When the engine was switched off, we too listened out for noises, but all we heard was the howling of wolves. When we stopped, the loader lit the blow lamp which every panzer carried for preheating the engine. It was our only source of warmth, it sooted up, and the sticky lamp black got everywhere, especially on the skin. Freezing to death was, however, worse. It began to get light, where we were and how far we had to go to the nearest German positions we had no idea. I had no map. In any case, our trail was not a road which might have appeared on a map. To my left, on the horizon, some black dots suddenly appeared, moving towards us Russians. I watched them through binoculars. Russian horsemen. There were no Germans on horses here, twenty to thirty of them, who now halted and watched us. We had just made a stop to cool the engine. Gunner, turret three o'clock, riders, range two thousand five hundred metres, high explosive shells, fire at will. That was how it was ordered by the book. In this situation it was done a little less formally, but quicker. Three rounds into their midst, and I saw them turn about and disappear into the countryside. We moved on and came to a small wooden bridge over a ditch. Because of drifting snow, it was hardly noticeable. The panzer under tow went too far left. The driver failed to recognise the situation and slipped off the bridge into the ditch. On that smooth surface, I could not pull him free with my panzer. Only recovery vehicles could help. With their winches, they could retrieve even heavy vehicles such as this. So what now? I could not leave their crew here in no man's land. I did not trust myself to blow it up. Scherf had gone off to alert the retrieval platoon. But where was it? Thirteen hours had passed since we had separated. Depending on how the decision to destroy the panzer by explosives was viewed, as justified or premature, I would have one foot in a court-martial. I took the five men of the crew into my panzer and we drove on. I was in luck. In the distance I saw vehicles and a white flare rose up meaning these were our own troops. I responded with the same, another ten minutes and we met up. They were elements of 17 Panzer Division. They knew about us, had expected us, contacted Division by radio, and told me that our recovery vehicle was on its way to us. We drove back to the casualty in order to be on the spot for all eventualities, in case Russians surprised us, which in this vast territory was possible at any moment. Three tractors turned up in all, the job was not difficult, and we went back to Proletarskaya in convoy, which took hours. Since Oberleutnant Scherf had left us, we had been on the move or at a standstill for exactly thirty hours. Hauptmann Langer greeted me. Well, that was a nice little trip across the boating lake. It was clear to me from his reaction what an event it had actually been. Meanwhile, the hour had long passed when the men in the pocket at Stalingrad could have been rescued by means of a counter-offensive. The pressure on the pocket was already such that the units of the surrounded army no longer had the strength to break out which Hitler in any case had expressly forbidden, and the available forces for a breakthrough to Stalingrad from the Kalmuk steppe were much too weak. Our company received orders to transfer in its entirety to Rostov, this city had to be held until all German troops falling back from the Caucasus had passed through. Another newly formed Tiger Abteilung had also arrived in our sector in January, Heavy Panzer Abteilung 503, which had been formed in Austria and had two complete Tiger companies. After the end of the fighting on the Kalmuk steppe, we were initially subordinated to this Abteilung, and then, as its third company, absorbed into it completely. So we lost our independence, the surplus supply units had to be given away, and we were once again a normal company of about 150 men. All the same, behind the official designation 3rd Company, Heavy Panzer Abteilung 503, we always added in parentheses, 502, and we kept our symbol, the mammoth, and never put the 503 symbols on our panzers. That was the case until the end of the war, although by then it was no longer 503, but Feldherrnhalle, of which more later. We had fixed quarters in Rostov until the beginning of February 1943, through without water, light and heating. These had to be improvised. The repair teams worked flat out and gradually got every panzer operational. 
From a radio panzer, we got ourselves a medium-wave radio and now could receive the official German station. Its transmissions were continually jammed by the Russians. Suddenly we heard in sonorous tones, Stalingrad mass grave, Stalingrad mass grave. Every day the Wehrmacht High Command transmitted its bulletins. Especially in times of crisis, this tended to be ambiguous. But if you read between the lines, you saw that the situation in the south of the Eastern Front, and especially around Stalingrad, was catastrophic.